Hi, I'm Femi OK, and you're in the stream. Uganda's President Yoweri Museveni has just been re-elected again. So after 30 years in power, he gets another five years in office. We're going to ask Ugandans what they think about that. And Ugandans will be telling our digital producer all sorts of things for the last three or four months. They really have. The show is just getting started and already we're hearing from so many of you. As Femi mentioned, this election has been on our radar for months. As you can see, we've received this pitch many, many times from you over the past few months, with some of you asking us to cover this as early as April of last year. Now, in the lead up to the vote, Ugandans were using countless hashtags, and they managed to find their way online on Election Day, despite a social media shutdown by the government. Now, members of our online community in Uganda sent us videos like this of their experiences at the polls, even as some people alerted us to a new hashtag, that hashtag Museveni Decides. It's taking a more cynical view of the election. These are the current leaders of the polls. That's what Derekin wrote on Thursday, listing Yoari, Yakaguta, and Museveni, the full name of Uganda's current president. Now that we're covering the story, we want to hear from you at home. So let us know what you think with hashtag AJStream. Hi, I'm Simon Kahero, media analyst and journalist in Uganda. My Twitter handle is at SKahero, and I am in the street. President Museveni, who has ruled Uganda for three decades, is the declared winner of the country's general elections. With more than 60% of the vote, Museveni secured a fifth presidential term, making him one of the longest-serving African leaders. But the election was overshadowed by violence, arrests, delays at polling stations, a social media shutdown and allegations of vote rigging. Museveni's main challenger, Kisar Beseje, was arrested four times over the last week and his party headquarters was stormed on Friday by police firing tear gas. He has rejected the outcome and called for an independent audit of the results. European Union election observers said the voting was peaceful in the vast majority of the country but criticised the lack of transparency and independence of the Electoral Commission. Museveni dismissed that criticism. Many Ugandans were hoping that these elections would address a number of issues, including the faltering economy, massive unemployment, improvement of public services and development of the country's natural resources. To help us talk about the fallout from the general election, we're joined by Irene Ikumu, a coordinator with the Parliament Watch Uganda Group, Bebe Kuo, a musician and supporter of President Museveni, Andrew Karamaji is a lawyer and activist and TMS Teddy Rouge, an entrepreneur working on solutions for social change. So good to have you all here. I, I like the all Ugandan lineup. So, uh, Andrew, you went to vote. What was that experience like? What did you find? What happened? I'm, the area where I vote from is one of those that did not receive polling materials until late in the day. So many of us were unable to cast our ballots precisely because of the delayed delivery of voting materials. As you can imagine, many people had given up, chaos had started breaking out, Um, people had become riotous and were burning materials and asking election officials about where the materials were and why they hadn't delivered them. So it was a chaotic scene. What did they tell you? Well, they said they didn't have vehicles and I, I live in the capital, Kampala, right. in, near the central business district. So we couldn't understand why materials were delivered to the countryside, mm-hmm. but couldn't be delivered to a place as close as the capital, the central business district. Let me, sh- let me show you another voter's experience. So he went to vote on February the 19th, which was the day after uh, the main vote, because it took so long for people there to get their polling um, station material. Uh, have a listen to what he said about that experience. We were here yesterday, everyone had come here to vote. But when we reached here, there were no ballot papers. And those one who happened to get ballot papers, there were no boxes. We had to put those ballot papers if you are, if at all you've finished voting. And sometimes if at all, all those things are there, there were no pennies to take the ballot papers. So people had... Look, looked at it and the lost temper. See, by the call, I, 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 that's just frustrating. What happened? What went wrong with a smooth running of an election? Well, 
Um, according to me, I would say that uh, first and foremost, they must uh, tell you that where you got all this information is Kampala, which is a stronghold of the opposition. So before I say anything, you're not going to get anything nice from Kampala. That's is, is that why materials were not delivered, Mr. Bebeku? Secondly, I believe it's only natural and normal that an election won't be 100% perfect, be it in the U.S., be it in, be it in any, any, any country. But, baby, cool. So That's first, not even if an people excuse. can agree that it's not years. all Kampala, uh, 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 if, 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 if it's not, if, if you can let me finish what I'm saying, it's not the whole of Kampala. Okay, it's a few parts in Kampala, and just not even Kampala alone. And if you come up and say that you did not cast your vote because there they were no voting material, then on the same polling station, there were NRM people who were supposed to have voted for NRM too. It's and NRM is the ruling party. Typically, just everybody and you said, was you said Kampala, was Mr. Bibeku, you said yes, Kampala NRM is, is a ruling party. So I don't want somebody, it, it's only genuine. So is that why you did not That's deliver materials? Turns, no, let's not talk like kids. Yeah. Let, let's talk, uh, you know, no, uh, like, no, you let's said. think out issues. I didn't say, yes, I said it's a stronghold because that's what ended up like. It's the stronghold, it's blue so when you as go a lawyer, look at the charts. So as a lawyer, I think okay? that that's more so for I, you not to deliver materials. Now, you see, that's where you go wrong. Because, you see, if you go to a level of a lawyer already, you're leaving a layman down. I'm thinking like a layman. I'm not even a lawyer. I'm not even a politician. But I'm only saying okay. that it is important for the first time before you even make judgment to know that also if, if, if there, were no, there was no voting in a certain area or a certain polling station, it's two sides that lost, not one side. Well, no, um, maybe not. let me just add some perspective that. to this discussion. I agree with that. Let me just hear yeah, me. Let me just add some perspective to this discussion. Um, when, you, when you look at the way that voting was handled, first of all, Kampala and Wakiso districts are the two biggest districts in this country. They're the most populated. They are also the closest to the Electoral Commission's offices. Now, this is largely where um, over 90% of the delay in delivery of um, voter materials was affected. These were the two districts most affected, including Jinja um, and Entebbe and other, other areas like Rukonjiri. Now, when you also look at the effect that this had on tallying, you find that um, up to 162 polling stations in Kampala and 119 polling stations in Wakiso, their tallies were not part of the official result that was announced by the Electoral Commission. So these delays did right. have significant effects on the outcome of the election because um, districts like Kampala and Wakiso have been um, noted as um, opposition strongholds by a lot of analysts. So there was a big concern about what the delays have um, on, the, on the effect of the election. Regardless of what side you're on, this was an undeniably big mistake that the Electoral Commission made on, on voting day. Yes. And, so and when you talk about that, Sandra, you talk about Irene talked about a big mistake on the part of the Electoral uh, Commission. This is a tweet that we got from Aria who says, I can't tell which is worse, incompetence of the Electoral Commission or the removal of my right to speak, i.e. social media. That's what they're talking about, the shutdown, as we mentioned at the top of the show, of social media platforms. So, Teddy, um, when you see these two things put forward as uh, the reasons why this vote was so tense and why people found it problematic, what do you make of that? Well, it's, it's, um, it's emblematic of um, the military dictatorship that is uh, specifically will do anything that it takes to stay in power. The disenfranchisement of over one million people with the missing, um, with the missing poll, uh, poll stations that were not reported, Wakiso, Kampala, as many as, many as uh, others, uh, a total of uh, 1,700 polling stations that were not reported. Uh, that were not reported, that is nearly one million uh, voters that did not participate. On top of that, their voices, uh, to be able to report this and to be able to say, hey, something is wrong with this, were actually curtailed. But good enough, Ugandans found a way around that ban and were able to actually report and actually say, hey, we are not participating. And largely, all of that, all of that frustration led to the complete silence that was when uh, President Museveni was allegedly announced as the president. That is an indictment that this entire process was not free and it was not fair. 
Well, Malika we, and... We don't, uh, we don't, no, don't no, see I the 60% celebra celebrating their win. I, I, don't, I, I, don't, I don't agree. I totally disagree with what you're saying when it comes to celebration because that is definitely not true. What happened in Kampala is opposition created a certain kind of threat that in case they announced President Museveni, there's going to be a lot of trouble. So the what people did, did and not also you must put it at the back of this your mind, created by at the, the back of your mind, party. remember that How most people in Kampala in vote from their villages, okay? Most people were registered no, in their doesn't... villages. So people left two days Whether before. Or not okay? they and the citizens yes. of well, Kampala... Femi, Femi, so yes, I, 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 hear, I, hear this, I hear this back and forth. And obviously, being yeah. supporters of different candidates, you're going to have a different perspective. Let's just push things on a little bit more, because what's really, really critical here are the issues that Uganda has right now and who can best address them. You have President Museveni for the next five years. Bebe Cool, why is that a good thing? What are, what are the main issues for you that he can tackle with another five years in office, bearing in mind he's already had 30? Well, uh, bearing in good mind question. that he's already had 30, it depends on where he found the country. That's number one, because I value that so much. It depends on how you find the country. And then when you find a country, a good politician, I believe you have to prioritize the problems, okay? You're not going to be able to tackle all problems at a go. Seven, he came in with the gun. The country had been destroyed, not only uh, by the wars, but also by bad politics, okay? That was two or three presidents So history, before. so fast forward uh, 30 years to so what's really important for Uganda right now. 30 years, Uganda today has moved to a better position. I'm so, I'm so, I'm so happy that this is the first time you hear under any, after any election, you see Ugandans debating on, 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 on Al Jazeera. Femi, okay, this Femi, shows you how I, far we have I, gone. I, the image, the, the effect I, is I because need, I, I, I the seek your indulgence, Bebe cool. Ugandans are now getting involved. May I seek your indulgence, Ugandans Bebe cool. are now getting more involved in their local politics, which is a could you point out? Issue. Could you point out okay? two it, sectors? Could you point out two sectors that the NRM yes. over the last 30 years has, done. has developed and improved in a, and give security, us the figures? Security is 100%. Security is 100%. And the roads are at least above 60%. That one I'm very yeah. sure. And you cannot deny that. I asked for Femi, specifics. If I, if I, cool. I asked Femi, for specifics. If, if, if I may yes. respond to that. Andrew, you asked for specifics. I'm going to give you one via the that. community online because I want to get them cool. in here. They're what watching this said. conversation. <laughs> Just one second. So um, Andrew asked for specifics. There is a video comment we got from Ian, and he had a list of a few things he thought Museveni has done right. So have a listen. President Museven during his campaign, he always, he always talked about that his, food. his next five years will be focused on job creation and we expect we expect more jobs from from in the next five terms and we have seen it work he has tried he has tried it in the last years he has he has talked about in the industrialization of the economy and we have seen several investors coming in setting up industries here and they have provided jobs for a few years so, Andrew, he talked about providing jobs for the youth as something that is happening. This is Brian, who has pushback on Twitter. He says, Museveni has been talking about empowering the youth and wealth since 2006, but we're still unemployed. How do you actually, address that? Actually, sp speaking of specifics, thank you. Um, speaking of specifics, there's 83, anywhere between 62 and 83 percent unemployment. That, for me, does not sound like an achievement in terms of getting gainful um, I don't employment. think I don't think I don't so think you understand think your own question on, because on, you on, see on the point you of see, employment you asked for two specifics you asked for two specifics let, let, let that president finish. Museveni has done and I came to you and I told you security and at least 60 percent of the roads in Uganda let's, we did not talk, talk about, about jobs I didn't go to security. jobs because you asked me let's for two specifics security. here and that's where let's you talk people about security. who criticize NRM go wrong you, you, let's you talk don't about even security. answer Bebe questions cool. the right way. You, let, let, let's talk about security. security. Uganda is safe. Bebe cool. allow Andrew to respond. Go we ahead, have, Andrew. Yep. Let's talk about security. We have armed guns in the capital here. We have intermittent insurgencies <laughs> in the countryside. That is in and the we US. have 
it's, it's all over. We US. have a proliferation. We have a proliferation of small and light weapons across the country, both in the central areas and in the outskirts of the country. How Legal. do you reconcile that Legal. with the security? With the security that you're talking about. So, guess remember that we have more than you in the conversation. Just go hold tight for one second, Malika. What did you specifically ask? Because I feel that you specifically didn't get an answer. Well, the question was about youth employment and unemployment and whether or not that's been addressed. No, Teddy, addressed that. Teddy, I hear you laughing there. I would love. I would love to actually. Only someone this called question. Teddy can address this. Teddy. Oh, oh, thank you. There are Uganda graduates 400,000 graduates every year to a job market that can only handle maybe 10,000 jobs every year. If you're trying to tell me that you are addressing security, the first thing you need to understand about this country, it is 70% under the age of 30, actually 78% under the age of 30, 50% under the age of 15. When you're graduating that number of people onto the streets of Kampala or Jinja or wherever else into this country. And all of that is idle energy that is looking for something to do. There is mounting frustration about people unable to actually participate gainfully in, in, in uh, the job market in this country. When you have that many people joining the ranks of the unemployment into the country, that looks to me like a powder keg of insecurity. You can't so tell me that threats. the only thing... It, it is a security threat to this country. Can you something? can't tell me you're handling security for 30 years when Can at I the very something? same time, the very same 30 years, give me a second, in the very Can same 30 years, Singapore, Singapore was at the same level we started 30 years ago and look at where it is right now. It has been able to actually walk and chew gum at the same time in terms of handling security from insurgencies, from regional security issues, to creating jobs, to innovating, to growing the education sector. And where are we? 30 Bebe years call. later, still briefly, talking about Briefly, because I want to can move I, on. Can I, yeah, can, I, can I add something uh, small? Can I add something Bebe small? Bebeko first. Bebeko. In the, sure, let, sure. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me say this. Let me say this clearly, OK? As a Ugandan, I've, be, I've lived here, I've made my life here, OK? I, I did my education here, and I know that the most important thing that I can agree to is many people are not employed. But on the other side, the beautiful part is you began by saying that 40,000 uh, graduates come out every year, OK? So that means he could have put education, 400,000 come out every year. He could have put education as a priority before seeking for jobs. Because you see, if he availed jobs before the education sector, getting you 400,000 people, OK? And Let education, me add something here. People being uneducated would have been guys, more guys, dangerous. Guys, hold on, hold on a little bit. Irene, Irene, go ahead. Um, Irene, uh, Irene, sure. only more Irene can respond right here. Irene, go ahead, Irene. Thank you for the protection. Guys, I've actually <laughs> read all the, <laughs> all the um, of all the leading presidents on a number of the issues that they touched. First of all, let me point out that this is the first election where we've had um, a semblance or, or a situation where we've had critical discussion around issues. Now, some of the key issues that came out during the campaigns and the very first um, elect election debates that we did have, which is the first time we've had them in Uganda, was the question of unemployment, specifically health, was a question of the economy um, and edu the education sector. So now to touch on the issue of unemployment that Bebe Kula and Andrew are talking about, and Teddy as well, let's look at what, for example, the government has offered so far. The government's approach to addressing unemployment over the last five years has been really to promote entrepreneurship. And, and in that regard, they have set up um, venture capital funds to support young people. Um, the, their approach to creating jobs has been largely inviting private investors to the country. And then now we have a most recent, um, what people have been calling a recruiting of militia groups, crime preventers, which in some ways has addressed the unemployment issues. Because the most people that have joined crime preventers are between the ages of 20 and 35 years old. So it's largely young people who are unemployed. 
that are looking for options and avenues in which to look for jobs. You know, Irene, it's That's those young said, people um, that you mentioned that are also tweeting us. So I, I, I just wanted everyone to know that I'm receiving about 32 tweets per minute, which is uh, okay. somewhat of a record for us. And so you've been seeing them come out on your screen there. You can see most of them that I can't get to. So I want to push this on just a little bit to what they're telling us. This is a Facebook comment that we got from Patience, who says, we might need change in Uganda, but we don't see hope in the opposition. Long live Museveni. And on the other side, you have this tweet, and I see you, baby, cool, nodding your head. We have this tweet, though, that says, the views of a single opposition party yeah. do not entirely reflect the opposition voices in Uganda. So, uh, Andrew, I want you to address that. Is the opposition ready to uh, take over power in the next, you know, after five years? Is, is there someone there Beautiful that's ready to step up for Beautiful this? Question. Let, let me underscore this. Let me underscore this. And I'm sure Bebe Kool would be interested in listening to my answer. Where we are as a country today, 53 years after independence, the questions that we are faced with are existential. These are not questions that can merely be resolved by what color or political party or affiliation one professes. We do not have a national value system. We do not have a political ethos. We don't have a clear culture that defines who we are and how, we, how citizens relate to the state. What is important right now is not partisanship or who belongs where. We must all agree that our country is in the throes of a serious existential problem which we must resolve collectively as a whole. And this is the motivation behind efforts like the Democratic Alliance, which was an attempt at putting together all pro-democracy forces um, and other initiatives like the National Consultation for Free and Fair Elections, which was snubbed by the incumbent General Yori Museveni, um, and among other efforts that are designed to finding a solution that does not rest on the politics, on partisanship, but a solution that first lays the foundations of a country. Then we can move forward Agreed. to d discussing right, so, other questions. But, so here's what here's, 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 can, can I comment, can I comment about... Um, Irene, can Irene, you go first. Rebecca Cole, yes, stand by. The, 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 Irene, go ahead. The, the statement that she okay. has made so or I'm the question she has asked... My own analysis of this, this, this election is that the key question has not necessarily been whether the government can continue to rule or opposition can rule. When you look yes. at the build-up to this particular election, there were a number of polls that came out that did put the president in the lead. Um, and for a lot of voters, they did expect the president to, to go in the lead. Um, so the question is not necessarily whether the opposition is bad or the president's bad, but the manner in which this election has been handled by the Electoral Commission. Um, so the question is not necessarily whether the president won or the opposition would have won, but the question is that to have free and fair elections, there are certain minimum requirements that must be achieved precisely, or that must be set precisely. in the election. All right, so guests, just, just, just give me a moment. All of the guests, the ECA, just give me all a, a moment, because I know there's so much to talk about. This is such a rich election. conversation. Um, Bebe Kaur, does President Museveni, does he hear that there's some dissent in the population does he is he taking this on board certainly when the european union oh, yes. observers actually said uh, this election this this election did not go smoothly this was not a fair and free election he rejected well, that criticism but what about from his own population how is he responding um, to this debate he is incorrigible Bebe Kaur, who is the support of president Museveni, who spent a lot of time with him recently what's your response yeah um what, what I can say to you is, of course, the president here has spent a lot of time okay? with him being and he's taking matters perform. matters very seriously because, for example, for example, um, every advantage that the opposition had to use. Take a good example of uh, right. the, so, the lack so of Baba Kaur, I, I specifically uh, wanted to know how President Museveni is responding to the criticism, responding to the fact that not everybody is happy that he he won another term. Specifically about that. Go ahead. Uh, definitely, he's, 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 he's not bothered by the fact that he definitely did not expect positive words from the opposition, but he's only bothered by the fact that they have a point in what is lacking in the country. But he's not bothered about how their response is, because their response from the opposition has definitely been animalic. If you, if you look at the internet, and, and definitely he has said it himself in, 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 on TV yesterday in his address. 
Okay. I, I hear right. sighing from, from the guests. So, so guests, bring your sighs online to stream.outofzero.com. We will pick up the, the conversation there. Hold tight for a moment because I would like Malika just to give us a last thought from the community. Well, I have to be too. Angela says, Museveni, I like him as our president. On the other hand, you hear, I'm young and I'm dissatisfied. All right, more to talk about. And we will be doing that at stream.outofzero.com. Thank you, guests. We're taking you online and hopefully your audience can come online too. Thanks for watching. Hello, this is Streams Online Post Show. We've been talking about the outcome of Uganda's election and the impact that that outcome might have. You've heard the vibrant conversation on TV, equally vibrant online, Malika. Mm. This is a tweet that we got from Andanyo, and so we're looking forward to what happens five years from now. This is Andanyo who says, the young people who voted are vowing never to do that again as long as Museveni is still in power. And he puts in parentheses, lost hope. Irene, is this something that you're hearing from people you know? How true do you think this is? Are people turned off? Hmm. Well, first of all, you need to appreciate that for a lot of young people, this was for most of them the first time that they were voting. Uh, because a lot of young people in Uganda have been accused of having a lot of um, apathy towards the election. Um, so also because most of the young people were in urban and prayer urban areas that have, have access to social media and can express their views, their biggest, these were also the polling centers that had delays in votes where a lot was uh, disputes about the results and voter staffing. And so for a lot of people, they feel frustrated that they, they did not feel that their vote actually counted in this particular election. But again, I blame that more uh, on the irregularities that the Electoral Commission had. Because, you know, a free and fair election is about how people perceive the outcome of the election rather than the results itself. All right. So um, let me just share this with you. Here we go. This is from the European Union. This is a quote about the Electoral Commission. The Electoral Commission lacks independence, transparency and trust of the stakeholders. I, I'm just wondering, Teddy, what would be our lessons learned from this last general election for Uganda? Well, one of the first things that I would de definitely say is a lesson learned is not to declare, you know, uh, whether or not the election was free and fair until after um, the numbers were counted, until the entire electoral process, all the way up to declaration of the president, uh, is done. I felt a little disenfranchised, actually, in and in, uh, underreported in terms of the problems with this entire election process by them announcing whether or not it was free and fair before actually the counting had started. Um, it is, I went, I actually went to some of the polls here in Kampala and saw the enthusiasm of all of the people that were participating. All, everyone participated in voting. Everybody stayed at the poll station to actually count, to watch their vote actually be counted. And for it to, from there to the electoral commission for their vote not to actually be counted is egregious to their efforts to actually participate in the country's electoral process. And I think that will do a lot greater damage in 2021 to a whole bunch of youth who want to participate in the electoral process but feel that their vote is actually not going to be counted. And I think that is the greatest danger and the greatest loss uh, as a result from these elections. Because I have superpower skills, well, Teddy, I, I, I know, I know that you know Andrew was writing something down. Andrew, you can tell us what you wrote down in just a moment. Irene, go ahead. Well, you know, um, this is not the first time that, that um, election observers and people generally have questioned um, well, how much has been put into the election. The, uh, if you look at the European Union observer um, reports of 2011 and 2006, all recognized that there were irregularities and all of them made recommendations calling for some sort of electoral reform to strengthen Including the electoral the Supreme commission. Court. Now, this has not been done, and therefore there are still gaps um, in how the election, electoral commission handles elections. There are still questions about its partisanship and impartiality in handling elections. There are still, question, there are still questions about its mandate and how it ensures that all candidates can participate freely and equally or have an equal playing field within the election. So there's definitely a question that if you want to improve citizen perceptions towards democracy and towards voting, it is very important mm -hmm. that electoral reform is carried out in this country so that it builds citizen confidence in the system.
So Andrew's and making notes. Hey, and, for Andrew, all, all uh, Andrew is making notes, which is banned on this show, but I have super eyesight, so I know he's making notes. Andrew, what did you want to add, just briefly? No, I am um, more of a conceptual point. You, you, you are probably, all of us on this discussion are familiar with something called a pressure cooker, which has a little vent at the top. And every time the pressure builds inside, it's, that, that valve helps to let off the steam. Now, if you shut off that valve in a way that no pressure can leave this, this vessel, the likely outcome is that this vessel is going to explode. I'm using this analogy to make the case for if you've shut off all avenues. This is the seventh election we've had as a post-independent country. All, all these seven elections have led to, haven't led to a change of government. All changes of government have been brought out because of, through the barrel of the gun. I'm worried that this country is going to go through an episode of war because, or any other bloody type of episode, no. because increasingly, if all legitimate avenues are continuously shut that kind down, of language leaving, can i say leaving, something leaving can I citizens say, can, with no other option can other I than comment? the alexandria can, can i comment to use another analogy what i can guarantee you let, let me say let me say this what i can guarantee you is that's the same reason why the opposition in this country is has gone wrong on issues. When you're discussing issues, every time you bring in that threat, even a person would have thought of listening to the points from the opposition, as long as he senses that you have that issue of saying that the resolution would be the gun, okay, as you brought up your pressure cooker issue. Let me tell you something. Bebe cool. why did Yuri Museveni go to the bush? I know that cool. when there's a lot of why did President Yuri Museveni go to the bush in 1980? You, Why did President no, 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 Yes. Um, I was saying that when, when you come up with that example, it shows clearly what kind of concept that you're trying to say, that at a certain time, Ugandans will get fed up and, and, and you know, explode and then put up a war and stuff like that. Now, that's the same reason why we end up not going for the opposition, because we know where the country comes from. The layman, I speak on the level of a layman, we know where the country comes from. So if anybody can tell you that they can have that as an option, then the best thing to do is to stick to the same old okay. man who will make sure that there's no trouble in the country. I mean, because security is key to, to, to the development of Gentlemen, the give me a moment. Well, Irene, so Teddy, hold tight for a second. I was saying that um, Andrew does make an, uh, an interesting point there because you have to look at how um, in Uganda that the NRM government, which is the ruling party, is very closely linked to the state and therefore has access to resources that opposition parties don't have. Now, in that regard, when you look at even the build-up to the election, there were questions about harassment of the opposition uh, and intimidation, harassment of uh, media journalists. There are up to four journalists who are injured quite um, horribly um, in the build-up to election just because they were covering um, activities of the opposition. So there are questions about spaces for opposition and people to be able to express themselves freely and to be able to assemb assemble freely which the government has not been able to do. Um, and so this leaves a lot of Ugandans feeling like they don't have so many options or so many rooms to address their concerns. The government in the building... All right, I, I mean, we're, we're, coming, we're going around in circles. There's something that we haven't mentioned. I, I mean, just give me a moment, because we're right at the end of the show, and Bebe Kaur and Andrew and, and Teddy. I want to show you this. I'm sure you've heard this before about your president. Uh, this is what he said back in 1986. Have a look on my laptop here. The problem of Africa in general, and Uganda in particular, is not the people, but leaders who want to overstay in power. I'm sort of face palming right now, because that was 10 years ago. Um, actually, more than 10 years ago. Yes. <laughs> was it 30 years ago? I, <laughs> and I, I'm, so, I'm, so, I'm so shocked by this quote, I actually can't do maths. But, but this, can, can it's like, that? what happened in 30 years that he, that he changed his mind? Can I answer that? Yes, Can please. I answer yeah, that? That's, that's a question now, that I love to people are this, this country, well. let, let us agree that in the world, dynamics keep changing depending on the change of technology. According to me, Okay, it is very simple. I bring back the aspect of me being a layman. Okay, the dynamics changing could have changed a lot. Besige, 
FDC Dr. Kiza Besije, last campaigns, he declared that he would never stand again. It is on record. But at the end of the day, we actually don't be surprised if maybe uh, uh, the president of FDC, Mugisha Mutu, if he had stood, maybe there could have been a better result for, for FDC. But you see, it's recurring, okay? It's not only Museveni. Anybody who could have treated that only forgot to treat the one for Besigia when he said last time that it's going to be So, I'm, I'm lost in the explanation for why your president 30 years later is not living up to something that he said 30 years ago. Because he feels we are not yet getting the right president to take over, and us who are voting for him That's still that, feel the same that way. That's his choice. I'll, I'll just choice. use I'll just use uh, one sentence. I think just one sentence. That is Ugandan's choice to actually make that selection. Yeah. Yes. It's not Teddy Teddy, choice Teddy says, says that that's Uganda's choice, not your yeah, president's choice. Yeah, but Ugandans choice. voted. Ugandan's choice. They voted not the sixty percent. Choice. It is not by in the Constitution. It's the not the president's choice to say the Ugandans is ready for. I agree with you. For another I, president I agree with you on oh, that. Oh goodness me. Okay, very cool. Just agrees with Teddy. I should probably stop there. Andrew, you said you had one sentence. Yeah. One sentence <laughs> is what? Irene, we're done with this show. But Andrew, what was your one sentence? My one sentence is when liberators in courts overstay their welcome, they begin to wear the robes of the tyrants they ousted. All right, that one sentence will start a whole new conversation, but we're not going to do that right now, but I am going to go to Malika. Um, I'll end with two tweets. This one, uh, prefacing it by saying most of the people online, especially those who have been tweeting us, are, are definitely anti-status quo. So this is Sydney who says Museveni has Ugandans at ransom for things he did 30 years ago. Truth is, we didn't even exist back then. We are now. This is the youth speaking. But I want to end on this tweet from Richard who says this was a good show because the more we talk, the more we create a clearer future. And still we rise. I hope your politicians are listening to this conversation. Uh, so thank you to Irene and Bebe Kaur and Andrew and also Teddy as well. Thank you to the crew. Have a look at the crew camera. There you go. Thanks, crew, very much. This, uh, this show was brought to you by the Al Jazeera crew in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching, everybody. See you soon.